معك سمير ما الله ميسي ان شاء الله اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We will go back to Surah Hud عليه السلام verses 29 through 31 بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويا قوم لا أسألكم عليه مالا ويا قوم لا أسألكم عليه مالا إن أجري إلا على الله وما أنا بطارد الذين آمنوا إنهم ملاقو ربهم ولكني أراكم قوما تجهلون ويا قوم من ينصرني من الله إن طردتهم أفلا تذكرون ولا أقول لكم عندي خزائن الله ولا أعلم الغيب ولا أقول إني ملك ولا أقول للذي تزدري أعينكم لن يؤتيهم الله خيرا الله أعلم بما في أنفسهم إني إذا لمن الظالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم So the first story in this chapter is about Noah, and Noah's nickname is Shaykh al Anbiya. He's a leader. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abu al Anbiya, a father, and Noah was before him was the master, the leader of the prophets, and he had some difficult times with his community. Difficult times trying to educate them, trying to save them, try, trying to bring them to, to the right path. Nuh السلام, had a long discussion with them because his ministry was also long. His ministry was not short. The longest ministry of any prophet was the ministry of Nuh. And Quran mentions him in, in more than 20 chapters he's mentioned. In each chapter, a few verses about some aspect of his life, some of his discussions and his arguments with his community. In this one, he says something very important. وَيَا قَوْمِ O my people. He was so kind when he talked to them. So nice, so humble. Though they are hitting him and slandering him, but still they are his own people. وَيَا قَوْمِ You are my people. I am one of you and you are of me. We are together into this. 
though some of you hate me, you make fun of me, but I'm not going to leave. And I'm not going to turn against you because you are my qawmi. You have to have love for your community. Those who turn against their communities, they have they harbor a grudge against their people and their communities. They are not doing good. They will regret one day. So he addressed them, Waya Qawmi, I still love you and I still care about you. La as'alukum alayhi malan. The first principle of my work and my approach and my message is that I am not asking of you any wealth in return for what I am doing. In ajriya illa ala Allah. My reward lies only with God. What does that mean? Then how he's going to eat and drink and support his family. What he's trying to say is that my mission, this mission that I'm doing, the da'wah, reaching out to you, trying to guide you and teach you and save you and advise you and educate you, I'm not doing that because of money. No, not because of money. I have some higher and bigger goals and objectives in my mind. I am doing what I am doing because I believe in this mission, because I love this mission. I'm not doing it for economic reasons. I'm not opening a business here. Prophets, anbiya, imams, even those scholars who really follow the tradition of the anbiya, the ulama, those who are truly, not falsely, truly follow the tradition of the prophets, their goal in their mission is not to make money. Not to make money. They can make money, probably more money somewhere else. But they dedicate themselves, themselves to this cause because they believe in it. They have a'tiqad. They love what they are doing. It's like a teacher. Some teachers, they can make money, more money elsewhere but because they love teaching. They teach at a lower, much lower salaries and advantages because they love teaching. So Anbiya did not come to open a business to profit financially. No, it's not. So he says, I'm not doing that for money, not for financial considerations but for spiritual and moral objectives God is going to reward me I look forward to God not to your pockets I'm not looking at your pockets so if someone asks then how does prophets and anbiya they sustain themselves go to chapter 8 surah al anfal chapter 8 verse 41. They have a share. In the Prophet, they have a share. Part of your share has to go to God and to the Prophet to sustain their mission. Because he's a full time, he's dedicated to this. But he's not making a profit. The money that you give to the Prophet and the Imam is going to use it to advance the cause of religion and faith and Islam. And at the, at the end of the day, my friends, there are some religious scholars nowadays, preachers, Jewish preachers, Christian preachers, Muslim preachers, scholars. Some of them, they work for the dunya and some of them, they work for the akhir. And you can find this in every sector in life. You can find it with physicians, with attorneys, with laborers, with managers. It depends on the intention. What is your intention? What is your intention? I know some scholars, they believe in the mission. Even if they go hungry, they would still do the same work. Because they believe in this, they have faith in this, and they have a trust in God. And when they speak, and when they deliver, it comes from their heart. The speech and the sentence and the word 
if it comes out of the heart it will go penetrate it will penetrate the hearts of others but إِذَا خَرَجَ مِنَ اللِّسَانِ لَمْ يَتَعَدَّ الْآذَانِ If someone is not speaking out of your heart, he says something that he himself does not believe in, he himself does not practice, in that case, his speech and his advice would not go beyond the ears. Only it hit the ears. It does not reach the heart and the soul. So he fails in his mission. But if the person is sincere, he believes in what he says, and he does practice what he preaches, then his sentence is going to hit the hearts. The hearts. And he can foster change. He can bring unity. He can be a source of unity, not a source of division. So this is number one point. Nuh says, I'm not working for wealth. I'm not looking up, to, looking up at your money. I'm working, I'm, I want my reward to be solely from God. The second thing, let me tell you my strategy with you. What did they tell him? They told him, listen, Nuh. All those poor people are following you. This is what the notables, the elite, the rich in the society told him. They told him, you are inviting us to believe in you. Look at who are, who are those who are around you. Those who are, those who are empty pocketed. They are poor. So if you want us to get on board, you have to shun those people. You have to drive them away. Because we are not going to, to be with them on equal footing. We are not going to be in a session where poor people are there. We are not going to mingle with lower class citizens. Unless they are like us, rich. This was their argument. Listen in return what he says. وَمَا أَنَا If you ask me to drive them away, I'm not going to do that. وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا and I shall not drive away or shun those who believe, the believers from around me. Why? Because, because you are rich and you don't want to sit with the poor. I'm not going to succumb to you. Because this is inequality. This is disrespect for the humanity. He was telling them, you measure the importance of a person only by his wealth. And this is not right. You are not looking at his reason, his brain, his personality, his contribution, his soul, his purity. You are disregarding all these things. You are looking at his pocket. If his pocket is full, then he's important. Then he's welcomed. If his pocket is not very much so, you don't pay attention to him. And this argument not only existed during the time of Nuh, this argument existed during every time, every prophet, including today, including America. In this society, if you are rich, you have a voice. If you are not rich, you don't have a voice. In this society, in Europe, in the Middle East, everywhere. But the Anbiya, they came to change this discourse, this perception. This is wrong perception. We also have to change this perception. This is not right. One day a person comes to the Prophet, he was super rich. And the Prophet people gathered around him to listen to him, to pay attention. And there was no empty spot. So this rich man came and he looked at someone who was poor. He said to him, I'm standing here and you see me standing and you don't give me your space. The man was heartbroken. But 
But the Prophet was there. Prophet said to him, come here. He cut his speech, the Prophet. Said to him, what did you say to him? You want him to give his space to you? Who are you? Who are you? Maybe this person goes to paradise and you go to Jahannam. If you want to be with me, you have to stop this nonsense that you are rich and you are big, big. Just because you are rich, you are better than others. That does not work here. So he said, oh, I'm sorry. The man, the rich man, because he was embarrassed. He said, I'm sorry, Ya Rasulullah. I'm, so, I'm willing to give half of my wealth to this man as a compensation. The Prophet turned to that poor man. He said to him, would you like to take half of his wealth? He said, لا يا رسول الله أخاف أن يدخلني ما دخله I don't want to take his money because I am afraid that I am going to be like him, arrogant. Leave me alone. I am humble now. Anbiya, the prophets, they came to teach respect. Don't look at how much people own. Don't base your evaluation for any human being on how much he or she owns. Look at their personality and their character and their human value. Maybe they have something more valuable than money. Maybe they have a truth. Maybe they have honesty. Maybe they have loyalty, which is missing today. So Nuh was tell, tell, telling them, I'm not going to listen to you and drive those people. Those are pure people around me. I'm not going to do that. وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who are true believers. إِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ إِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقُوا رَبِّهِمْ وَلَكِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ قَوْمًا تَجْهَلُونَ Because those people are going to be with their Lord. Stand before their Lord. If you don't take care of them, the Lord takes care of them. If you neglect them and ignore them, the Lord is not going to ignore them just because they are poor. This argument that you have is the argument of those who are ignorant. A community who does not have human principles and human values, does not appreciate human values. Jahiliya, qawman tajhalun. And this is a problem that still exists today, even in Muslim societies. Some people, because they are from the aristocratic class, because they are rich, they don't want to be with the poor in the same place. Even in the mosque, even in the mosque, sometimes they divide the mosque. This is the mosque for the rich, this one for the poor. This is only for the black, this is for the white. This is for those people from this tribe and this family and this clan. This is for people who don't have family. This is not right. This is discrimination. This is ugly discrimination. We have to fight these things. We have, we have to fight them inside ourselves, inside our hearts and thoughts, and externally, inside our communities. This haughtiness and arrogance has to come an end. This is why we have Hajj. In Hajj, you find all people are there. We don't have first class, second class, third class. We don't have. All people, they circumambulate. They are Ibadullah. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila siwarikum wa ashkalikum. God never looks at your zip code and your house and your bank account. He looks at your hearts and your deeds. If your heart is a pure, you are with God the richest person. Even if your balance in the bank is zero. Because your heart is rich. What creates societies, strong societies, healthy societies and healthy families is the rich heart. Not the rich pocket. Not necessarily the rich pocket. وَلَكِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ قَوْمًا تَجْهَلُونَ And then he says, 
And suppose I will shun them and drive those people away. Who's going to protect me on the day of judgment against the wrath of God and the punishment of God? Who would help me against God on that day if I to drive them away, to drive those poor people away, those believers? And this is a lesson, my friends, a lesson for all of us. Do not disrespect any person because he does not have what you have. Because he does not wear what you wear. Don't. Don't do that. Because his lifestyle is different than your lifestyle. Never dis disrespect people. Because this type of disrespect will invite punishment. Punishment in this life, dunyawiyya, and punishment in the hereafter. And God is not going to remain silent when such types of crimes and injustice takes place God is not going to remain silent be careful how you speak be careful be careful how you greet be careful how you establish relationships be careful how you look even how you look Try to be humble inside you. Even if you think I am better financially, socially, philosophically. But still when you treat people, try to treat them in a humble way. Be a humble. Humble yourself. Allah Allah does not love those who are arrogant and haughty. And they have sense of pride and vanity inside them. Be careful how you speak with people. Don't break people's hearts. Just because they are not at the same level like you. Just because they can't afford living in this area or that area. Don't. We have been told and advised by our Imams that even if you give some financial help to someone, give it in a way that you do not look like as if you are doing him a favor and saving his life. Don't do that. Give him and tell him thank you for accepting. Give him in a humble way. Give him in a humble way. Some arrogant people in Mecca when they wanted to give some money to some poor, they would not give it to them straightforward. They would give it to them from their back, see? See? Even when they give charity, they give it in an arrogant way. Islam said, لا تبطلوا صدقاتكم بالمن والأذى If you want to give charity, don't hurt people's feeling. Don't disrespect. He's a human being. Don't do that. Give it with humbleness, humility. Give it with love. Give it with a smile. I can't find better than Ahlul Bayt in their conduct. Imam al, -Hus Imam al Hassan, when someone comes to him asking for something, Imam would not look into his face so not to recognize him and not to embarrass him. And some people, when they write their need on a piece of paper, before they finish it, the imam will give them money. He does not want them to wait there, there longer. They asked them, they asked Imam Hassan, wait until they finish. They finish their sentence and they give it to you. He said, no, because the longer he stands there, the more he feels embarrassed. I don't want to embarrass him. I want to give him immediately. This is the way. This is terbia, my friends, terbia. We need to get engaged in these acts. This is real Islam. Believe me, real Islam is not salat and siyam, just salat and siyam, which is empty. Real Islam is the way you deal, the way you appreciate humanity, you respect humanity, you reach out to them.
You give them a value. وَيَا قَوْمِ مَنْ يَنْصُرُنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ إِنْ طَرَدْتُهُمْ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Will you not remember? Will you not remember? We have in the Quran tafakkur and tadakkur. Both terms. And they are different. They don't have the same meaning. Sometimes the Quran says أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And sometimes أَفَلَا أَفَلَا تَفَكَّرُونَ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Will you not tafakkaroon? Will you not use your brain? Because afala tafakkaroon, tafakkur, when someone does not know about this. So Islam is bringing this to his attention for the first time. This is tafakkur. But tadakkur, he knows about this, but the dunya keeps him away from respecting it. Do you know the difference now? Tafakkur, afala tafakkarun, means that the person, the community, the family, the individual is unaware of this situation. So the Quran brings it to his attention. So he pays attention to it. While afala tadakkarun, the second one, the first one, tafakkarun, the second one, tadakkarun. Tonight, before you go to bed, say it 500 times. تفكرون تذكرون تفكرون تذكرون The second one أفلا تذكرون It means that <clears throat> that you know this inherently you know and netly you know your fitra your nature knows this but unfortunately arrogance haughtiness vanity makes you forget about it so now I have to remind you. The second one, it's about reminding us. And then the third one, it says, Here he is telling them four things. Nuh, when he's inviting his community, he's not cheating on them. He's not telling them lies. He's very honest. He's very straightforward. He's not concealing something. He does not have secrets. He's very open. This is why he's telling them four points. When he invites them, he wants them to know about these four points. What are the four points? He says to them, Wala aqulu lakum indi khazainullah. Wala aqulu lakum indi khazainullah. I am not going to cheat on you and lie and tell that I have with me the treasuries of God. I'm so rich, so follow me, I'll give you money. No, I don't have. Khazainullah, his treasuries are with him. I'm just a normal human being with one difference. Qul innama ana basharun mithlukum. I'm a normal human being like you with one exception. Yuha ilay. I receive revelation. I'm a messenger. So I don't have, I'm not a multi-billionaire promising you false promises that if you follow me, I'm going to make you rich. No, nothing like that. Yes, you're going to get rich spiritually, morally, but not necessarily financially. So this is number one. Because sometimes people follow someone because he attracts them through his wealth. People get attracted to the wealth. I know someone who told me once that I have, when I go to certain European countries, I have to stay in seven-star hotels. I said, why? Because he said, oh, I go to sign deals. So when they know I'm in this, and limousine brings me from the airport, and I'm in this hotel, they take me serious. If I stay in... Motel 6, you know, or whatever, nobody is going to look at me. See, so he has to do something to attract. The Prophet says, no, financially, I'm not going to tell you I have money, so come, follow me. I'm, I'm just like you. The second, nor do I know the unseen. Unseen belongs to God, my friend. 
This is one of the differences between the Shia and Sunni traditions. In the Sunni traditions, especially the Salafi tradition, they believe that the prophets, they know nothing about the ghaib, the unseen. In the Shia tradition, they believe that the unseen belongs to God. It is his discretion. However, God may give it to certain people that he likes. And this is a verse in Surah Al-Jinn. Surah Al-Jinn, when you go home, check it out. Verses 25-26 in Surah Al-Jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alimul ghayb. I am the knower of the unseen. It belongs to me. My discretion. This is my khususiyah. This belongs to me. فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا إِلَّا مَنْ اِرْتَضَىٰ مِنْ رَسُولِ he does not disclose the ghayb to anyone except what he likes. The people that he likes. They could be imams, they could be prophets, they could be awliya. Awliya is not imam, he's not a prophet. Wali, someone who does good, morally good. Allah allows him to find out about a secret ghayb and scene that others cannot find. This is a verse in the Quran. So, ilmul ghayb belongs to God. But God has the freedom to bestow this privilege on certain people. Probably for a certain amount of time. One day, one hour, one second, maybe one year, maybe 20 years. Maybe this limited knowledge or unlimited knowledge belongs to God. The control is in God's hand. So the Prophet cannot know the ghayb unless God gives him permission. He has to get permission from God. This is the difference between the two traditions. Keep these things in your mind when you have discussion with your brothers and sisters. We have to bring the Quran as an evidence. Once you bring up, I am the Quran, you are successful. No one can argue against the Quran. Clear cut evidence here, powerful evidence. Therefore, we have to take care of the Quran, my friends. We have to read the Quran. Make some room, make some time for the Quran. With understanding, with translation, with tafsir. We have to take care of the Quran. Third, وَلَا أَقُولُ لِلَّذِي وَلَا أَقُولُ إِنِّي مَلَكِ This is the third. I don't say I'm an angel. Because you're going to tell me do this and no, I'm a human being just like you. I'm an I'm not an angel. I'm قل إنما أنا بشر. Because this is how they looked at the prophet. The prophet has to be an angel coming from down from the sky. If he's one of us, then he's not not good. He's not good. He's not fit for this role. He says I'm not an angel. I'm telling you. I'm a human being, just like you. وَلَا أَقُولُ إِنِّي مَلَكْ And the fourth and the last وَلَا أَقُولُ لِلَّذِي تَزْدَرِي أَعْيُنُكُمْ Nor do I say to those who are despicable in your eyes. You don't like them because they are poor. They don't have money. I'm not going to say to those وَلَا أَقُولُ لِلَّذِي تَزْدَرِي أَعْيُنُكُمْ لَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ I'm not going to run them, drive them away and tell them God will not give them any good. I'm not going to say it, insult them and hurt their feelings. You want me to hurt their feelings? I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to do that. اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا أَنفُسِهِمْ God knows best what is in their souls. Sometimes God looks at this soul, he says, this person better than 500 people. God looks at our hearts and souls. We don't look at each other's souls. We don't. We look at each other's shapes. But God is different. God's evaluation is based on our souls, nafs. If your soul is a pure, God would love you. God does not worry what you wear. 
Nothing. He would not look at your dress. He would not look at your clothing. He would not look at your bedroom. He would not look at your furniture. He would not look at the type of car you drive. Never ever. Neither he's going to look at even your color or language or accent or family or blood. God looks at your soul. Allahu a'lamu bima fi anfusihim. He knows best what is in your soul. Allahu a'lamu bima fi anfusihim. Inni idhan lamin al-zalimin. If I mislead you and lie to you, I'm going to be one of the wrongdoers. But I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be honest with you from the beginning. If you want to get on board, ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome on board. If you don't like these things and you think I'm rich, and you think I have to drive away those poor people and bring you instead here? I'm not going to do that. And I'm very honest and open with you. As a result of that, the vast majority of his community, they disbelieved in him. And they rejected in him. As you're going to hear, inshallah, next week or the weeks, inshallah. We're going to study Nuh and his struggle with his community. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'wat innaka ghafiru al-khati'at innaka ma'hi al-sayyat Let's recite amman yujibu al-muftar for a couple of people who have some illnesses and they asked us to remember them during Thursday night and Friday tomorrow. So let's make dua for them and raise our hands. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir Rahman ar-Rahim Amman yujibu al-muftarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su' Amman yujibu al-muftarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su' Amman yujibu al-muftarra إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله اللهم من على مرضانا بالشفاء والعافية اللهم المرضى المنظورين ألبسهم ثوب الصحة والعافية عاجلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وعجل في فرج سيدنا ومولانا وإمامنا وقائدنا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثواب الفاتح مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد